happy to be here and to present to you the work that we've been doing uh, in my group for the last uh, two years, which we call the physics of AI. So there is a lot that I want to tell you. So let's, you know, let's get started. Um, so the presentation is going to be divided in three parts, which are roughly of uh, equal length. For the first part, I want to give you a little bit of the context for the talk. I think many of what I will talk in the first part, everybody, you know, is aware of it. I mean, nobody can ignore ChatGPT and the likes, but I still would like to, you know, make sure that we're all on the same page so that we can move on to the the two other parts. In particular, in the first part, I will try to make the point that we're really witnessing the emergence of intelligence in artificial systems, and that this emergence comes from very simple components. Okay, so this is what I will talk about in part one. Then part two and part three are our approach, you know, which we call the physics of AI. In part two, I will give you a, a very controlled experiment that we have been uh, running to try to see, you know, to witness emergence, you know, uh, firsthand. And that part will focus on really emergence through the lens of data uh, diversity. And then in the third part, uh, which is a more recent work that we did in the summer, we'll talk about a different approach from physics, which is coming up with toy mathematical models to study the dynamic of emergence. And there we will focus on the gradient descent uh, dynamic. Okay, so let's get started with part one. And, uh, you know, we are being inundated with uh, headlines like this these days. You know, every day there is an article in the New York Times about uh, AI. So this is from, I think, already a couple of months ago, you know, when uh, DALI 2 uh, was being announced uh, by OpenAI. So the title says, you know, we need to talk about how good uh, AI is getting. And I think we really need to talk about it. It is really incredible. And, and I know that some people are still skeptic, I think, uh, fewer and fewer, you know, by the day. But some people are still skeptic, in particular because we've been talking about the AI revolution for more than a decade, you know. And we have been talking about many, you know, advances that are just on the horizon and then they never happen, etc. But I, I want to say that from my perspective, this time it's different. This time it's for real. And, and the reason why I say that is, you know, look at this picture. So this picture was generated, you can see it if you can read the, 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 the caption. This was generated using, you know, the words infinite joy. And you understand for an artificial system to understand those very abstract concepts, to have an idea of what it means, infinite joy, it really means, I think personally, it means that it really understands those things. And it's able to manipulate, not only, you know, it's not only able to create a, a chair that looks like an avocado, but it's able to, uh, to comprehend much more abstract concepts and manipulate them and merge them. Okay. So, so this is what we're, we're going to be talking about. Um, so what has happened, you know, why, why is it that suddenly these things are, are taking off and, and, and uh, that I claim that intelligence is, is emerging? So what has been happening really in the last five years is the rise of scale, okay? So this plot, I think, you know, many people, many of you probably have, have seen it. So you see this exponential growth in the size of the models, the size of the neural networks that we're training were as, measure, as measured by the number of parameters. So you see, you know, it starts roughly uh, ex almost exactly five years ago with a model by AI2, which was roughly 100 million parameters. And you see, you know, it's growing exponentially. And the last one that I have on this plot is, you know, January 2020, which is uh, Microsoft that came out with the Turing model, which at the time was 17 billion parameters. And that was the bigger. Of course, you know, if I continue this in 2021 and 2022, you know, this is the point of exponential, you wouldn't see anything. Okay, so if we, if we want to continue this plot, we need to move to a, a log scale. And in a log scale, it's very clear. It's just linearly going up, okay? So, so you can see, again, this is the same, the, basically the same uh, uh, models as we were talking about. In addition, on this plot, there is GPT-3, which is a 175 billion parameters, and there is Megatron Turing, which is uh, 500 billion parameters, you know, and, and, and these things uh, keep going up. Uh, and, you know, interestingly, this is roughly, you know, the latest in terms of publicly known models. But you can imagine, of course, that, um, you know, uh, all those companies are, have not been, you know, asleep since, uh, you know, uh, the end of 2021. So, so there is more on the horizon. And, and you know, there was the announcement uh, just yesterday of, you know, uh, being integrating uh, some uh, new model in it. So this is, this is part of, of all of this. Okay. Now, really, you know, I think this picture here really capture very vividly what's going on. So this is a picture from uh, Google, from their model, which is called Party. So this is one of those 
text to images model. And what's nice with Party is that it's purely a transformer model. And I will remind you in a minute what are transformers. And here, what they did, so again, text to, to image, and, and the, the, the text that they give is a portrait photo of a kangaroo wearing an orange hoodie and blue sunglasses, standing in front on the grass uh, of the Sydney Opera House, blah, 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 ho holding a sign on the chest that says, welcome, friends. And what's interesting is that they give us the output from four different models that are different sizes. So a model with 350 million parameters, a model with 750 million parameters, 3 billion and 20 billion. And you can see the improvement. You can literally see it. Like it just, you know, the kangaroo becomes more and more stylish. And suddenly when you move from 3 billion to 20 billion, suddenly from some reason, the text becomes correct. You know, before, before 10 billion parameters, somehow it doesn't know how to write text. And after to, uh, 10 billion, it, it knows how to write text. Okay, so this thing that suddenly some properties seem to appear purely by scaling up, this is what we call emergence. Okay, so emergent behavior is, I think, top of mind for, for the entire uh, AI community. So this is another uh, picture that I have taken from uh, Google. Maybe I should have uh, tried to search for more Microsoft pictures. I, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but in any case, uh, um, in, in this picture, what they will show to you is as they train, uh, as they scale up a large language model with more and more parameters, they see that it can do more and more things purely by scaling up. So you see that at 8 billion parameters, it, of course, you know, if it's trained to do language uh, modeling, it has some uh, language understanding, it can do some question answering, and also, interestingly, it's able to do some arithmetic operation, which is something non-trivial, and actually, below 8 billion parameters, those models do not know how to do arithmetic. You scale up to 62 billion and suddenly it adds, you know, whole, a whole host of capabilities. For example, now it's able to do translation, which it wasn't able to do before. You keep scaling up to 540 billion and now suddenly it can, you know, explain jokes. You know, before it, it, it didn't get a joke. Now at 500 billion parameter, it gets jokes. Okay. So this is really, you know, this, this emergent thing. You know, maybe a slightly more scientific uh, plot from, from this, uh, uh, survey uh, by Google, again, emergent abilities of large language models. So you see different tasks and they have different models, you know, GPT-3, Lambda, you know, Chinchilla, Palm, all of those large language models. And you can see that as you scale up, and here importantly, notice that the x-axis is not just number of parameters, but it's the total compute time that was spent for training. So this combines both number of parameters and training data, because the training data is of course of the essence in this story. And you can see time and again on all those examples, that there is sort of a phase transition. Nothing happens for a very long time, and then suddenly they start to be able to do the task, okay? I, I think the nicest one that I like is, is arithmetic, you know. You, you, you train your model, you know, on a lot of text from the web with a lot of parameters, and if it's not enough, if it's below a certain threshold, then it doesn't know how to do arithmetic. And after that, it just goes up linearly, and very quickly it's able to do it uh, fully, okay? So, you know, before I ask, uh, you know, the question that we want to study in this uh, presentation, which is how does intelligence emerge and, you know, what, what does uh, physics has to do uh, with the question, um, I would like to make sure that we are on the same page and I will review what are transformers. Because, you know, at the end of the day, one of my points is that everything in this story is simple. The components are very simple. This is just a transformer architecture, which I will explain in a second on which, you know, you train with gradient descent to do next world prediction on a large corpus of text. That's all that there is to it, okay? So this is uh, the paper we're gonna talk about for the next uh, five minutes. Attention is, is all you need. Uh, you know, that was uh, posted five years ago, a little bit more than five years ago now. And let me say something extremely important to me is that this is gonna be the only reference in this talk. And this is terrible behavior on my part. The, I, I really don't like it. The problem is this field is exploding so much that if I had to do the citation and if I had to explain everything surrounding the work that we're doing, it would take me at the very least another extra hour, if not two more extra hours. It would be very interesting. I would love to do it, but you know, uh, I, I just don't have enough time. So apologies. This is the only, uh, you know, reference in this uh, presentation. Okay, so what is attention? First, what is, you know, let's slow down for a second. What is, the, again, you know, classical neural networks, of course, all of you know this very well. So a classical neural network, it takes a high dimensional input, a vector X in RD, 
and it takes you know just a single vector x in Rd, and what it does to it is a, a, a set of very basic operations. You have neurons, and each neuron, what it does is that it corresponds to itself to another high-dimensional vector. Let's call it W. This is the filter. And what the neuron computes is just a linear function, w dot x. Okay, so it just tests the, the, the function w against the input x, and then it applies a non-linearity psi. For example, the rectified linear unit, okay? Or uh, just, you know, the positive part. That's what the neuron computes, okay? And so the point is that those w's, those, uh, you know, filters, they are being learned. We're going to run gradient descent on them to find what are the best W to fit the training tasks that we're giving to it. Okay? This is a classical neural network. I won't say more about it. Now, the, the leap of transformers, the jump, in my opinion, is that instead of operating on a single input X, like an image, for example, it's going to operate on a set of inputs. Okay? So it's going to operate on a set of inputs and the key is that there is going to be an attention module, which is going to be an additional layer, you know, you layered, you layer those operations in a neural network, that's, that's what you do. And here in the transformer, one of the layer, you know, you're going to alternate classical layers, which are like this classical neuron that I just described, with attention layers. And what the attention layer do, in essence, is the same, basically the same thing as a classical layer, except that it replaces those learned filters by the other element in the sequence. You understand? It becomes, the key point is that it becomes a relative machine instead of being an absolute machine. What I mean by that is, imagine that, you know, I want to, to tell if in an, in an image there is two, uh, two similar objects. Okay, this is my task. And now, you know, maybe in my training data, I have only seen cats and dogs. This is all I have seen. So if at this time I have an image with two birds, I'm not able to tell whether there are two birds in this image because I have only learned the absolute filters of cats and dogs. But transformers will have no problem to do this because it's not learning a filter of a cat and a filter of a dog. It's learning the concept of two. And, what it's and, and how does it do that? It does that because it compares the different parts of the images. And if there are two parts that match, then it says, ah, I have a match. So, you know, the answer is yes, there are two similar parts. So this is really, you know, this, this uh, aptitude to compare element in the input sequence, this is to me really what enables analogies. You're comparing things. This is the essence of reasoning. And I think this is why those transformers are so uh, successful. Moreover, in addition to this point, sets from a modeling perspective, they are also very powerful. Everything is a set. I mean, you know, sets are, are the, the basis, the foundations of mathematics after all. So for example, a sentence, it's nothing but a set, not only a set of words, but a set of pairs, words and position. It's important to remember the position. In reinforcement learning, when you do decision making and you have a trajectory, you know, you have a set of triplets, you know, action, you know, next action and, and reward. Okay. Um, if you have graph data, you know, you're trying to do a protein uh, uh, folding prediction, same, same story. You can also view it as a set. Okay. And really the, the, the starting point of the transformer revolution is that transformers now, they can be applied to everything. Every field, you know, where we have been doing AI for, for decades now, transformers are revolutionizing uh, those fields, okay? Be it natural language processing, reinforcement learning, you know, and so on and so forth, okay? Now, I, I want to have a technical slide on how the attention module works exactly, because when we're going to turn to experiments, I will try to see in the experiment what's going on, you know, really mechanically. Okay, so to get into the mechanics of what the transformer does, I need to explain to you, you know, uh, how, what, what is it uh, computing exactly. So the way the attention does, you remember I told you that it compares different parts of the input. So let's say I have an, an input sequence, x1, x2, up to xn. And I want to compare one, you know, my attention module is now going to look at one input element x in this uh, sequence. And the way it's going to do the comparison is that it's going to give rise to a probability distribution over the other tokens. This is the attention distribution. It's going to tell me this token, how much attention it gives to all the other elements in the input sentence. Okay? And the way I'm going to compute this is literally what I told you before. It's just going to take the other input tokens, we call them tokens in this case, the other t input tokens as kind of the filters. So I'm going to test my x against the other xi. I just take their inner product. This gives me a score. 
Now I want a probability distribution, so I'm just going to transform those scores, which could be negative, into a positive number. It's very classical to do it through the exponential function. Other choices could be made, but the exponential is nice for many reasons. So I, I put it through an exponential. Now I have a non-negative number. They don't necessarily sum up to one. So let me just renormalize by normalizing constant capital Z. And now this is a probability distribution that sums up to one. Okay, so again, this alpha i is a probability distribution which is given for the input token x. So each token is going to have a different distribution. Okay, so if you want, I can view this, I could view this as a matrix. This is a matrix, the attention pattern matrix, where I look at my input uh, sentence both on, as uh, the rows and as the columns. And what I put in there are just all the distribution that I, that I can see. Okay, this is my attention pattern uh, matrix. Now, what the attention model does is that it takes this sequence of input, x1, x2, up to xn, and it's just going to transform it into another sequence, x1 prime, x2 prime, up to xn prime. That's, that's it. And how does it do this transformation? The simplest, most naive thing you could do, namely, you just replace this x that, you know, uh, I, I have just defined with a probability distribution now, you just replace this x by a weighted average of all the other tokens weighted by the attention that this guy is giving to the other ones. That's it. Map x to the sum of alpha i, x i. Okay? Now, this is what's called one, this defines one attention head. Okay? And you notice at this point that there are no parameters. What am I going to do gradient descent over? So the only thing that I do now is that I add myself a little bit more flexibility and instead of doing all the operation in the original, you know, space with the canonical basis, which has no special meaning, I'm just going to allow myself to rotate the space, you know, both in terms of the filters, in terms of the input, and in terms of the recombination, which is called in the, in the transformer language, the query key and value. I view my X that I try to compare to the other guys as a query. I view the other tokens when they act as filters as the keys. And I view them when I recombine them in the formula sum of alpha i x i as the value. So I just add a linear operator, you know, at each of those occurrences. And now this is what I'm going to optimize over. This is one attention head. And what you do in transformers, you do multi-head attention. So you re replicate this thing many times. And then you just recombine all of them linearly. This is one layer of attention. Transformers, all they do is they alternate this one layer of attention with a purely fit forward one hidden layer neural network which act independently on each token okay and there are those uh, you know normalizations which are important for training and residual connections so that you know it does, these things don't really matter at least at the level of this discussion here okay and that's it this is a transformer architecture okay now z question okay so this was this is it for the background now let's get to the question z question is how does intelligence, like, you know, I think probably all of you have seen as you play with ChatGPT, I mean, you can just play with it, and yes, it makes a lot of dumb mistakes, but clearly there is some intelligence there. How does intelligence emerge from gradient descent, okay, based, based just on trying to do the next token prediction? So I didn't explain, but, you know, you need to define a loss function, and in this case, the loss function is just you give it a lot of text and you give a partial sentence, and you're just trying to predict the next token. So you do gradient descent based training to do next uh, word prediction. You have a large data set, very important, very large, very diverse, represents lots of things, you know, let's say roughly a trillion tokens. And you have a large transformers. What is large, you know, maybe let's say you have roughly a hundred layers, roughly, you know, a uh, hundred heads per layer. And you remember, you know, those tokens, they live in, in high dimensional space in RD, but you know, a sentence is just a bunch of discrete uh, words. So you need to embed first those, those uh, discrete tokens into high dimensional space. Let's say you embed them in dimension 10,000. Okay, this is it. You have those ingredients, you run it for long enough, boom, intelligence comes out of it. Okay, so this is the truth, really, is that I think nobody on the planet has a clue uh, about what's going on. Just, just nobody, we don't understand. Nobody understands. And if you do, please let me know. Um, you know, this is not the first time that humanity is facing a problem like this. This has happened uh, time and time again. And this was put much more uh, elegantly by uh, Arthur Eddington in the context of quantum mechanics, and it captures so well what's going on. Something unknown is doing we don't know what. And that's really, really the situation. 
We really, you know, we don't even know what we're talking about. What is intelligence after all? You, you know, there is even a problem of definitions. So how can we get started, you know? How can we make progress to understand this large system? You know, I, I, I emphasize that the largeness of it is important. It is key. So you have this very large system with many parts that interact with each other and there is some emergent behavior out of it. This sentence that I just said, many parts, complicated, large system and emergent behavior, this is what physics is all about. Physics is all about trying to decompose a system, trying to see what were the actual key elements to the emergent behavior that you're witnessing. Okay? And I'm not saying that we want to use the physics tool. What I'm saying is that we want to be inspired by their methodology. They have been grappling this problem with this problem for centuries. Let's see how they attacked it. Again, I'm not at all saying this is physics of AI. This is not physics for AI. Completely, completely different. This is not a talk about, you know, reusing, uh, recycling some of the tools that physics has developed over the last, you know, two millennia. Not at all. This is about developing new tools. I think they are needed, but we can be inspired by the way they approach those things. So how does uh, physics do it? So I think two, two main pillars of physics are controlled experiments and toy mathematical models. You know, when you, want, when you want to understand what water is made of, you know, why is it that water can become, you know, uh, uh, ice and, you know, or, or vapor or, you know, like those different phases of water. You don't look, go and look at, a, you know, stare at a waterfall and be like, wow, this is incredible. The water is jumping around, you know, this is too complicated. You need to make your experiments much, much more controlled. You know, how did we discover that there is a nucleus in the atom? You know, it was not by watching a waterfall. We had to do, you know, the famous uh, gold foil uh, experiment of uh, Rutherford. So what is, you know, what is going to be our gold foil experiment for those large uh, transformers? That's, that's what I want to ask. Again, the waterfall is uh, chat GPT, you know, and you're not going to understand anything by looking at the waterfall. Another angle is are those toy mathematical models. So of course in physics, we're very lucky because, you know, for some mysterious reason, nature is canonical. And so, you know, you come up with a toy mathematical model for one situation and it applies to everywhere. We don't know yet whether this is going to be true in, in AI, but, but we, should, we should definitely try. Okay, so what are the goals for experiment and the harmonical oscillator of, of AI? And what I'm going to do, you know, in part two and part three, is just tell you, you know, our attempts to, to try to answer those questions. And I'm not saying by any means that these are final answers. In fact, I know that they are not final answers. But they are, it's just to show, you know, the kind of things we could try as a community to do more of it. And we are not the only one doing it, you know. Many other people are doing it, but in my opinion, not, not quite enough yet. Uh, and, and you will see also that, importantly and sadly, maybe our discoveries contradict you know, the findings of the machine learning community over the last 20, 30, 50 years. So it's really something new is happening and we need, again, to, to develop new tools. So the first thing I will, I will tell you is a controlled experiment where we train a transformer in a very simple setting. Again, think this is our goal for the experiment. We train it to solve a system of linear equations. Okay, a very simple task. And we're going to see how the data diversity matters even for this uh, very simple task. Then the part two is going to be about the non-convex dynamic of training a one hidden layer neural network for a very special uh, data model that I will explain to you, which is sparse coding. And this is a toy model to really understand, you know, the emergence of edge detectors. I, I will explain all of those things. And this is based on those two papers that which are on the archive uh, with uh, many people, you know, uh, from my group at Microsoft and also uh, interns and, and students, you know, from academia. So I just want really to go over the list because these are uh, fantastic people that you know, contributed enormously. So the first paper that I will tell you about is, is Lego. Uh, the main author is uh, Yi Zheng, who was a, a postdoc with us and is now uh, full-time with the group. Arthur Backers, uh, Ronan Eldan, uh, who is a mathematician who has, you know, uh, decided now to really spend more time on, on AI. Surya Gunasekar and uh, Tal Wagner. And then, uh, so all of them, you know, were, uh, are in my group. And then uh, the second paper that I will tell you about, you know, I will explain all of those terms, learning thresholds via the edge of stability. Uh, these are with fantastic students uh, from MIT, also with uh, uh, Yin Tat Lee, who has just uh, recently joined my group from UW. Uh, so the fantastic students from MIT are Kong Jun An, Felipe Suarez, uh, and Sino Chui. Okay, all three of them uh, really, really outstanding. 
Very lucky to work with this uh, group of people. Okay, so let's get started and let's do our first physics of AI uh, experiment. We're gonna train for real, like no, no joke, it's gonna be a real training, uh, a neural network, a transformer to solve systems of linear equation. And I'm, we're gonna look at the simplest possible type of system of linear equation, which really looks like this. Okay, so even in middle school, this is too easy, but it's roughly the idea is middle school level uh, mathematics. So you have a, a system of equation like this. Oops, sorry, uh, how do I do it like this? So you just have variables A, B, C, D, okay, in this case, and you define relationship between them. And you know, Lego stands for learning equality and group operations. So we're just gonna have, uh, you know, equality operations, and there could be some group element which is applied to those variables. Here, we're only going to talk about the group with two elements. Namely, it's addition, it's, you know, you just leave it alone, it's the identity, or you flip it, you multiply by a minus one. This is all the operation that I'm allowing, but, but this framework allows for something more general. And it's very interesting what happens in, in, in greater generality. But in any case here, I'm just telling you the variable B is equal to minus the variable A. The variable D is equal to minus the variable C, and a, ah, a, I'm giving it a value. A is equal to plus one. And C is equal to plus B. So of course, all, you know, we, we know how to uh, solve this thing. You just follow the chain, you know, of equations, the, the chain of reasoning. So you start with A equals plus one. Then you look for the next A. The next A is here. Okay, B is equal. So what I do, you know, you, you really understand when you're training those things, you're teaching an artificial system which knows nothing about the world. So you really have to spell out every step in your mind, every reasoning step that you're making, and let's see how the, you know, uh, artificial intelligence will make those steps. So the first thing you do is that now you associate this A and that A, okay? You realize, okay, those two occurrences of A, they are the same thing. So if I know that this A is equal to plus one, I know that this A is also equal to plus one, okay? Now I apply a group operation minus. So now I need to manipulate. I have my concept of plus one. I have moved my concept of plus one from this part of the sentence to here. Okay, so this is the association part. I associate those two concepts. Now I need to manipulate this concept. You know, this was a plus one, but I applied to it the group operation minus. So I need to change it into a minus one. And then I just need to do a local operation where I put, you know, this minus one into B. So there are three reasoning steps here. Association, I'm associating concept, I'm saying the occurrence of those two variables A are the same. I'm manipulating concept, you know, I have a plus one, I apply a minus to it, this should become a minus one, and I'm doing some local, you know, uh, 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 local operation where I just gather the information, you know, for example, for this B, I send the information that I have on the right hand side of the equal sign to this B. Okay, three operations, manipulation, you know, local operation, and uh, association. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna train a transformer and we're gonna try to understand how it does those three reasoning, very basic building blocks of reasoning. Association, manipulation, and local, you know, manipulation. Okay, so we're gonna train a transformer. So again, you, you, you guys know now, uh, you know, exactly what is a transformer. I put in the input uh, sequence, okay? So I just embed in high dimensional space all of those tokens, the equal sign, the minus sign, you know, the comma sign, etc. All of those things are high dimensional vectors. I need to, um, to also have a positional encoding to, you know, reflect what is the position of all of those things. Now I train a big transformer, this, you know, uh, uh, alternation of, uh, you know, attention layers with fit forward layers. At the end of all of this, at the end of many layers, I have a new representation. And what I'm going to do is that I'm just going to append a linear classification head to each of the variable. So that I want to know, is it a plus one or a minus one? Okay, this is a very simple binary classification that I, that I do at the end on the uh, representation. Okay, and again here, I'm just saying the key point, association, manipulation, basic building blocks of, of reason. Okay, so let's do an experiment. We're gonna train a BERT size transformer, which is roughly, you know, you should think roughly 10 layers, 10 attention heads, a thousand dimensions for the embedding. Okay, so roughly an order magnitude less than what I told you would lead to emergence of intelligence. So, you know, not, not, uh, not crazily different, but, but smaller, okay? So again, the sentences, they are gonna look like this. They correspond to a certain chain of reasoning. My sentence here is, is scrambled, you know, it's not, it's not given in the order of the chain of reasoning, that would be too easy. You know, the, the different edges can appear anywhere. 
You can view it as a graph. You know, you start with the root node one, then a, you know, uh, is equal to plus one. So this edge is labeled with a plus, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now we're only going to train with uh, systems of linear equations like this with twelve variables. This is an arbitrary choice, you not know, twelve. Um, and uh, what else do I want to say? And we're going to order the variables in the order of the chain of reasoning. So in this case, variable a is the first variable, variable b is the second one, uh, variable e is the third one, and variable c, for example, is the last one. Okay, so they are ordered not in the in the order in which they appear in the sentence, but the order in which they appear in the chain of reasoning, which is a natural order. Now I'm going to show you a plot of how the accuracy rises as you train a transformer for the different variables as order in their chain of reasoning. So this looks like this. So again, I told you I have 12 variables. I order them from 0 to 11. And on the x-axis, you have, you know, number of epochs of training. And the y-axis is just the test time accuracy. Okay, there is, we're never going to be talking about training time accuracy. Uh, you know, those things, they always reach 100% training accuracy. That's not the, the point. We only talk about test time. Okay, the, the, the generalization part. And you can see, very nice, they all shoot up to 100%. And you can even see it's interesting, you know, the first, it's, it's, it's the first variable that shoot up to 100%. Makes sense. The, the network first learns to, you know, uncover what is this variable, then it's the second variable, then the third variable, and so on and so forth. For those of you who are paying very close attention, you will realize that it's first variable, second variable, third variable, and then somehow the last variable starts to increase before the other one. This is not a fluke. We can exactly explain what's going on. I don't have time in this presentation. You can think about it tonight if you want. It's a really fun exercise to, to, to think about what's going on, but you know, we understand exactly what's going on. In any case, you know, okay, great. Uh, transformers work, you know, uh, you know, they generalize and everything. But do they? Okay. So do they? So we, you know, just like I was telling you at the very beginning that a transformer could learn to test if there are two similar objects in an image. And I told you, you know, maybe you have training data with only cats and dogs. But the power of transformer is that then it's going to be able to detect if there are two birds, even though it had never seen any birds. Okay. So really the power, the intelligence, it's not the classical generalization IID machine learning. The power is really the extrapolation power when you're out of distribution, when you're seeing something that you have never seen in training. That's where, you know, intelligence happens, in my opinion. So what we're going to do is that we're going to be a little bit tricky with the network. And we're only going to provide supervision on the first six variables. Namely, you know, in a, in a chain like this, okay, so here I have only six variables, but we're only going to provide supervision on the first three variables. Meaning at training time, the network only gets a loss if it gets A, B, or E wrong. Okay? If it gets F, D, or C wrong, nothing happens. Okay? In other words, uh, another way to put it is that I'm training it to solve systems of linear equations with six variables but I'm going to test it with systems of linear equation with 12 variables. Okay, so I'm really going to try to see how it can generalize to more variables that in a, it has seen in training. And I'm just doing this setup so that positional encoding is not a problem. Okay, we don't want, we don't want different sequence lengths at training and at test time, that would be annoying. We want the same sequence length, so that's why, you know, I only provide supervision on the first half, but these things still appear, you know, as, as the X, as the input. It just doesn't appear in terms of the loss. And let's see what happens. It does not work. Okay. It doesn't work. So this network, you know, this BERT uh, type network here, I, I say it's randomly initialized, you know, we trained it from scratch. It does perfectly for the variables that it has seen in training, you know, up to variable five. But if you go to variable six, so just one more variable, it barely gets to 70% accuracy. And all the other one, you know, they don't, they don't, uh, you know, increase beyond 50%. You know, and, and I think, Classically, you would say, I mean, yes, of course, you know, it's, it, it, it's how, how would it know how to solve 12 variables equation? It has only been trained to see six variables. You know, it, it has no incentive to go the extra mile and solve the seventh variable. Okay. So, so, you know, yeah, this is totally expected. So now, you know, let's do something crazy, uh, which is what anybody in deep learning would say. I mean, you were crazy not to do that, which is, we're going to train with more data. We're not only going to train with Lego, but we're going to train with much more data. And what the deep learning people would say is they would say, don't train from scratch. First, take a pre-trained model. 
first take a pre-trained model, which has seen maybe an enormous amount of text on the internet. You know, maybe it has seen all of Wikipedia. It has learned to predict the next token on, on Wikipedia. Now take this as your starting point and now fine tune this thing on Lego. Okay. And let's see if that works better. This is what anybody in deep learning would tell you. Never, you know, just, just train on the task that you care about. Of course, something classically trained in machine learning would say the opposite. You know, something classically trained would say, just train on what you care about. You know, don't, don't try to confuse the system. So let's do the experiment. And the way, you know, here I, I frame it as, you know, either training only on Lego or training on Lego plus regular text. But really, you know, for, for all the experts, and I think all of you are experts, uh, it's really, I take a pre-trained model, the actually original pre-trained BERT, and I fine tune it on Lego. And let's see what happens. And the answer is, it does amazing. Okay, so the pre-trained BERT, the model which has been trained on text and now is continually trained on, on Lego, you know, it does extrapolation. Like one more variable, no problem, it gets almost to 100%. You know, two more variables, it gets to 80%, and so on and so forth. And, and you can really get all of those things to 100% with just, you know, what's called stochastic depth. We're, we're not going to talk about it now. You know, the point is really the difference between those two things. You know, how is it that adding this data diversity suddenly makes the network really more intelligent? I mean, in a way, really, you know, is it the case that the way this, oops, sorry, this, this was being solved here was kind of overfit to Lego? But of course, it's not overfit in the classical notion. This is test accuracy. This is not overfit in the sense training time, test time. This is overfit in the sense that it has developed inner, inner circuits which are only fine-tuned to this very special Lego and which do not represent the general type of methodology you want to apply to solve linear system. Whereas maybe this guy, because it has seen many more data, it has been forced to learn this much more general purpose circuit which are, which do extrapolate more, okay? And, and indeed, this is, this is exactly what we're gonna uh, discovering, discover, so what's going on? So what you can do is that you can scan through the attention head, you know, you can literally plot them. You, you input a, a Lego sentence and you look, let's say, you know, on the first layer, the 11th uh, attention head, what is the attention pattern? What does it look like? You can just look at it. And what you will see, in the pre-trained model, okay, so this has not seen, this has never seen a Lego sentence. It, it has never seen a Lego sentence. But you see those very structured matrices. What is this thing, you know, this bend diagonal thing on the left? This is exactly the local manipulation I was telling you about. What is this thing on the right? You know, I don't have time to go through it, but this is exactly the association. You know, the fact that there are two red points like this, it's exactly the fact that, you know, a variable A, for example, it appears twice in the sentence, and this thing fires exactly at the two locations of the variable A. So what I'm saying on this slide is pre-training has given rise to attention heads which implement the local manipulation, which you can think about it as a convolution, and the association pattern. And you know, maybe that's why this pre-training works so well, because it has learned those general circuits. On the other hand, if you scan through the attention head of the model that has only seen Lego, you won't see those things. You will see a lot of noise and maybe you will see a lot of those broadcast heads, you know, I don't want to talk about it too much right now, but you won't see this structure, okay? So again, these heads are natural to solve systems of linear equations. In fact, they are natural more generally for reasoning, okay? So now this is an hypothesis at this point, okay? Going back to the physics analogy, you know, we, through experiments, you make, you know, hypotheses and then you want to, you know, actually uh, test them. I mean, in general, this is the approach in, in, in science. So what we're going to do is that we're, we're going to forget about training on text. I mean, this was anyway a weird idea. What we're going to do is we have discovered those structures. What about if we put them into the initialization from the start? So we're going to put an association head and a local manipulation head into a BERT network at initialization and train on Lego. And the question is going to be, do you mimic the performance of pre-training? And the answer is yes, almost exactly. So the one on the right, this guy, has never seen an article in Wikipedia, you know, but it basically performs as well as a pre-trained model, okay? So again, I'm just repeating here that, you know, the diversity of data is forcing it to learn these general purpose circuits, which is what enables it, you know, to solve the problem with those tools and in turn make it possible for extrapolation to appear. So this is only part of, you know, the Lego paper. We have many, many more things in there. In particular, uh, you know, 
it gives you hints for architectural modification. You know, maybe we do want this association and manipulation head at the start from the initialization. Maybe we shouldn't, you know, uh, randomly initialize all those heads uh, all the time. Okay. Another way, by the way, to see it is you can think about all of this story as implicit regularization, you know, coming from the diversity of the data. This is another way uh, to put it, which is maybe more uh, in line with classical thinking. Okay, so this is it, you know, uh, for part two, which was about a controlled uh, experiment with transformer. And now we're going to uh, switch gear and talk about toy models for emergence. So trying to, you know, be a, a little bit more mathematically grounded because here, you know, it was, you know, we were eyeballing attention patterns and sure, we were designing experiment to test our hypothesis, etc. But we still have no idea what is it exactly in the dynamic of training that leads to either, you know, the beautiful structure of association and manipulation head or to the you know, crappy broadcast and noisy you know, heads that you would get with only Lego training. So what's, you know, what's going on? Can we, can we try to you know, understand what, what in the training dynamics leads to one or the other? So this seems very, very hard. I think it's, it's, a, it's an attainable goal. I don't know, you know how many years it will take, but, but it is attainable. But since we want to do something now, we're going to try to do something a little bit easier. So we're going to talk about the simplest possible case of emergence. What is the simplest possible case of emergence? In my opinion, it's the fact that on the first layer of convolutional neural network, you see edge detectors appearing. Okay, so you see filters, these W's that I talked about earlier in the talk, which really try to see whether there is an edge like this or an edge like that in your image. And then those things are combined in the next layer, you know, to, to, to try to detect faces, for example, et cetera, and so on and so forth. But we really want to understand why is it the case that when you train a uh, convolutional neural network on, say, ImageNet, why does it come up with this very structured, you know, uh, detector, edge detectors? And again, this is also too hard. So we're going to step, take one step further and now simplify into a, a, what I would call a canonical mathematical model and try to study for real, you know, mathematically what's going on on this canonical mathematical model. And the canonical mathematical model should capture the essence of those edge detectors. And I think the, the sparse coding problem, you know, does that very, very well. So this is what I'm going to explain to you now. I'm going to tell you what is a sparse coding problem, why it's like an edge detector uh, problem. And then we're going to analyze how does gradient descent on a one hidden layer uh, neural network train on sparse coding? How does it learn those edge detectors? What's going on? And you will see it's incredibly non-convex. You, you cannot do anything kernel-like. I mean, this is completely irrelevant. Um, so, so, so let's go. So here is sparse coding. You have some random basis, V1 through VD in RD. These are your edges, okay? This random basis, you can think about it as, as your edges, okay? Of course, the edge, edges, you know, they are not really orthogonal, but, you know, this is the first approximation we're going to make, is that we have actually an orthonormal basis, V1 through VD. And just to simplify, you know, so that I have less words to say, we're just going to assume that this is a canonical basis. Okay, so when you look in the direction of one of those edges, you're really looking at one coordinate. Okay, so I have the canonical basis and this is fixed. Okay, now an input example X is going to be made of one of those edges. So an, an, an input example is just going to be a random edge. So one element of my basis with some intensity, some, you know, Y in, in R, which is multiplying my edge. Okay, so I have some edge with some intensity on it and the rest is going to be white noise. Okay, so in other words, my model is just X is equal to Z plus Y V I. Z is just a Gaussian. Okay, so just random Gaussian coordinate, just N01 in every coordinate. And then there is one coordinate where I have a spike Y, and the spike Y is going to be an N0 sigma square. Okay, so sigma square is really your signal to noise ratio. If sigma is very large, then you have a very big spike in one coordinate. And of course, what is your goal? Your goal is you get X and you have to predict Y. Okay, so you get to see a vector, where, which is just a bunch of, you know, noisy coordinate, but then there is one coordinate which is bigger than the other, and what you have to say is, okay, what is the value of that coordinate which is bigger than the other? Okay, very, very simple problem. Now, of course, you don't know the basis. Okay, the key point, let me just say it again, you don't know those edges. The, the point is that those the edges, they have to be discovered, they have to be learned. Okay, this is a crucial point. Okay. So really, it looks like this white noise plus a spike coordinate, but in a rotated basis, and you don't know the rotation, and we're going to try to learn it. This is a sparse coding problem. So note that if the signal-to-noise ratio sigma squared is very large, if there is really a huge spike, 
then it's a trivial problem, of course. You can just sum all the coordinates. Just sum all the coordinates, you're going to have this big spike, plus a little bit of noise, you know. And so, you know, just the sum of it is going to be a good approximation to the target function. What I'm saying here is that if the signal-to-noise ratio is large enough, then a linear function solves this problem. We want to study a problem where linear functions are not good. Okay, we want to do the real deal where you really need to be uh, non-linear, non-convex. If the signal-to-noise ratio is smaller, you cannot just sum all the coordinates. What you have to do is that you have to look at each coordinate, and if the coordinate is small, then you have to snap it to zero. You have to remove this noise. You have to do some thresholding. Okay? So what you can do is you can still sum you know, all the coordinates, but the coordinates after a nonlinear operation is applied to it. You just want to threshold. You want to have a filter. Okay? So what we're going to call that, we're going to call that a thresholding unit. It's going to be a unit, so before, you know, when the signal to noise ratio is high, you can just look at the coordinate and add it with the other one. Now, a thresholding unit, a basic neuron that you need in your network, is to look at a coordinate and say, if it's small, then I replace it by zero. And if it's large, I let it go through. So what you can do is just a ReLU, a rectified layer unit with a negative bias. This is exactly what it's going to do. A ReLU with a negative uh, you know, bias is exactly going to threshold Everything which is below this bias is going to put it to zero. Okay, so the emergence of thresholding unit is what we're going to study, which corresponds to this bias moving to the negative. Okay, this is what we're really going to be trying to study. Now, let me say this again. In this low signal-to-noise ratio, ratio uh, regime, you can predict correctly with, with high confidence if you use a one-hidden layer neural network where the neurons, you know, the Ws from before, they are your basis element, Vi. And then you have a bias term, B, which is exactly set at minus square root 2 log D. Why square root 2 log D? Just because square root 2 log D, this is the maximum. If I have D Gaussian, then the maximum of them is going to be exactly at square root 2 log D with very, very high confidence. So what I need to do is just everything which is in the band between square root 2 log D and minus square root 2 log D, I snap to zero. And what is outside, I let it through. And this function does exactly that. Okay? Good. So this is the target network. This is really the function that we're trying to learn. Okay? And you see there is both a positive part and a negative part. This guy, it threshold anything which is below B and, 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 or minus B. And this guy, it threshold anything which is above B. Okay? So these are the two parts. And then, you know, I have a minus so that I exactly get the the answer that I want. Now, what we're going to do, this is our target. We would like to learn, we would like to learn those edges. These VIs, they are our edges. Okay, we would like to learn those guys. But what we're going to do is we're going to start with a random neural network. We don't know those edge detectors at first. So we're going to start, we're going to have K neurons, and we're going to look at a function, which is a sum for L equals 1 to K of AL. This is just the output coefficient of the neuron L. And the neuron L is computing nothing but the linear function WL dot X plus some bias term BL. Okay? And we would like to understand, the only question I'm asking is, you know, when is it that if you train on gradient, with gradient descent on this sparse coding problem, when is it that this network is going to converge to something like this? When is it that some of those filters WL, they are going to learn the correct edge detectors, they are going to converge to some of the VI, and the BL, they are going to converge to the threshold that, which is correct, which is, you know, square root 2 log D. And the answer, you know, it depends on the parameters of the problem. There are only four parameters. The dimension, uh, the number of neurons that I'm using, N, which is the number of samples that I'm using in my training data, and sigma squared, my, training, my, my signal to noise ratio. Okay? This is it. This, in my opinion, is the simplest possible question you could ask in the theory of deep learning. And we have no idea. Okay? We don't know. And I don't know. Okay? I'm not going to give you the answer. I don't know the answer. We don't know the answer to this question. Okay? So we don't know when is it that those edge detectors are going to be born exactly. But we have some hints that what's going on is actually complicated and actually difficult. And I will show you what we have understood because we have understood something. Okay. And I see that I need to maybe speed up just a little bit. Uh, okay. So uh, let's. Keep simplifying, because I just told you this problem is too hard. I'm going to simplify, and you're going to say, wait, 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 you're simplifying too much now. So I'm going to simplify even further, and I'm going to say, let's say we already know those edges. 
you know, I told you the whole point is to learn those edges. Let's say we, I even give them to you, okay? So you know those VIs, they are given to you. But what you don't know is still, you know, the output coefficient. Let's say, you know, you have a, a single output coefficient for all the positive neuron and a single output coefficient for all the negative neuron. And most importantly, you have this bias term B, okay? So now I have, I have reduced this to a good old, you know, three-dimensional problem. It's, it's in R3, okay? We have three parameters. A plus, A minus, and B, and we're just gonna run gradient descent over three parameters. And let's see what's going on. What's nice, you know, when you're in dimension three is that you can start to have plots. So we're gonna have plots like this, where here is the training loss, you know, over time, and here's the bias, so this is B, how, how is B gonna change over time, and this is, you know, what matters is gonna be the sum of A plus and A minus, okay? Instead of, you know, I have only three plots, so the training error, the bias parameter B, and you know, this, this, uh, the average of the coefficient A plus and A minus. So you see the training error, and this is the learning rate. Here the learning rate is very small, and you see the training error is going, going to zero, and the bias terms are not moving. So this is not good, you understand? The bias terms are not moving, it means I'm not seeing the emergence of threshold units. Those units are not thresholding anything. They are looking whether there is an edge or not, and just thresholding at whether it's positive or negative. But that's not what we want. We want to threshold, you know, when it's outside of a certain gap. So this bias staying to zero means that the generalization error is going to be terrible. Okay, this means that you really have overfitted. You have managed to train to get small training error, but the bias has not moved. You didn't get a, a threshold unit. You're not going to generalize. Okay, let's get, let's, let's do something. Let's get a slightly bigger learning rate. Okay, so this is a slightly bigger learning rate. We see exactly the same thing. Maybe it goes to zero a little bit faster. Okay, it still doesn't work. Now here is the crazy thing that's gonna happen. I'm gonna increase one more time the learning rate. And this is what happens. Suddenly, the training gets very unstable. Lots of oscillation. Not only, you know, in terms of the parameters, but also the training loss, which is something anybody who has trained neural network has seen. You know, net training a neural network is very unstable. You know, the loss is not just monotonically decreasing. There is a lot of variation. But now suddenly, the bias is also decreasing. So what we're seeing is, it seems that the emergence for this very special problem, the emergence of the threshold units exactly coincide with the moment where instable training happens. Which again, is com com completely contradicts everything we thought we understood about machine learning. Usually in machine learning, we say, instability bad, please remove the instability. You know, this, this will lead to bad generalization. Here I'm saying instability is great. Instability is what actually maybe gives you generalization. And in fact, it's even, I think, more beautiful than this picture. So, okay, it's related to this edge of stability. I really don't have time to say what it is. It's something very beautiful that was discovered at CMU uh, two years ago. And there are now papers, you know, coming out on it almost every week on the archive. And, you know, this is one of them, uh, but, but I, I don't have time to explain what it is. What I want to tell you is a, is a, is a, is a that part of the story is even more beautiful than this previous uh, slide uh, lets you think. Namely, that there is a threshold phenomenon. There is a phase transition, just like water, you know, there is a phase transition. So what we're gonna see here, again, in this part of the story, we're focusing on the learning rate. What I was varying in my previous slides was the learning rate, okay? As the learning rate gets bigger, suddenly you have more instability and suddenly you have emergence of threshold unit. So I'm giving you two plots here. On the x-axis, it's the learning rate. I'm increasing the learning rate. Here on this one, I'm looking at the bias term. And on, on the right side, I'm looking at the generalization, the test accuracy. And you see, at first, the, the test accuracy, it gets you know, flat. It doesn't improve. And then suddenly, at some point, at some level, you see here, I'm zooming in on this region, at some level, which is given by this green line, it suddenly starts to grow, the generalization accuracy. And turns out that this green line is exactly the moment when the bias starts to move, which is what I told you, you know, you will only get good generalization if you get the emergence of threshold units, okay? But they happen exactly at the same time, and not only that, but it's a threshold phenomenon. For a long time, nothing happens, and then suddenly, at the right learning rate, it starts to move. Not only that, but we were able to prove, and now this is a formal mathematical uh, theorem, after two more approximation steps, which I'm sure we can deal with, but you know, it's already complicated enough like this. The emergence, you know, this green line, this green line is exactly eight pi over d squared. Okay, so this is the moment at eight pi over d squared, 
for sparse coding with a one hidden layer neural network, this is the emergence of threshold units in terms of the learning rate. This is the moment, the, the, the limit between small learning rate and large learning rate. Okay? So just like before, you know, we had, uh, um, um, just like before, we showed that there was an inductive bias due to the diversity of data. Here, we have an inductive bias due to the large learning rate. Okay? It pushes you towards learning this useful structure. Um, uh, I, I started five minutes late. Can I, can I take uh, two more minutes to just finish this story? Yeah? Okay. So, so this is the last slide, and then there is the conclusion. So here I just want to say, because at this point, you know, it's, uh, I, it's, it's the point that I don't like usually in talks where it's very mysterious. But, but actually, it's very simple what's going on. What's going on is like this. Roughly, you should think that the optimization problems that we're talking about, you know, you remember there were this output coefficient A, and there is this bias term B. It's really like there is some convex loss function A, which is applied to roughly A times some nonlinear function G of B. This nonlinear function G of B, it's all the neurons, you know, that are combined with the bias B, et cetera. It's, it's a rough, it's a little bit rough to think about it just like that, but roughly that's the intuition. Okay, and this function G of B, you know, when B goes negative, when we move the bias, then this G of B goes to zero, okay? This is because if I have a ReLU and B goes to minus infinity, then you know you threshold everything. So let's study now. I'm going to show you a picture of gradient descent on the simplest possible problem, non-convex, which is I have a convex function, but instead of just taking L of X, I take of L of X times Y. You know, X times Y, it is the essence of neural networks. You multiply two things, okay? So L of X times Y, I'm going to now give you a plot. I have a, I'm in dimension two. X and Y are real numbers. Let's see what gradient descent does on a convex function like L of x, y, where the minimum is at zero. And before I show the plot, just understand, if the minimum is at zero, I have the y axis and I have the x axis. These are the minimum of this function L of x, y. Okay? And I have, you know, a landscape which is above it. And basically what happens is near the point zero, zero, it's a more flat minima. You know, there is more space where things are small. And as I move up the y-axis or up the x-axis, you know, it becomes more sharp minima. Because as soon as I step outside of this, you know, axis, then, then the, the loss goes up much more quickly. Okay? So this is a picture that you should have in mind. What happens is this. So let's look at the left side. So you have two regimes. You have the gradient flow regime and the edge of stability regime. The gradient flow regime is when you do gradient descent with a very small step size. And what happens is, of course, X and Y, they are both decreasing. They both want to go to zero. But at some point, you know, maybe, you know, X gets to zero first, and then you snap there. You're there. You're fixed. But what happens if you do gradient descent? If you do gradient descent, you go towards this, you know, Y axis, but then you miss it a little bit. And then you start to bounce around. And as you bounce around, you go down. So this bouncing around is exactly the inductive bias that gets you the Y to go down. The y going down is the g of b going down, meaning the b going to minus infinity. So this bouncing around, which is this edge of stability, the fact that you haven't converged because you have a too large step size, is exactly what gives you, you know, an inductive bias uh, to, to decrease your learning rate. And let me say, you know, uh, this picture, these are real experiments. This is not, you know, a toy uh, 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 picture. This is actually what happens. This is exactly what happens. And you can see, we can even exactly predict where you will end up on the y-axis. Okay. All right, so with that, let me uh, conclude. And, and uh, I don't know if we'll have time for questions, I hope, but maybe not. Uh, so, okay, this sentence is the most important one of the presentation. I think, even though, you know, I, I cannot uh, uh, explain fully, but really a miracle has happened. Intelligence has emerged, you know, you can see it in chat GPT. It's, it's just, it's just uh, world changing. Why, how? What we propose is this approach based on physics, based on the physics methodology, based on controlled experiment and toy mathematical models. We've seen two things. Lego, where you know, the diversity of data leads you to a, an inductive bias towards a useful structure. This is contradictory with traditional ML of IID training and test. Uh, you know, here I'm saying you shouldn't have the same distribution at training and test. You should have a different distribution at training, a more complicated distribution at training. Then we saw an, an example of a toy mathematical model, which was the sparse coding analysis. And there we saw that this instability had an inductive bias towards the emergence of threshold units, you know, uh, but uh, 
again, contradictory to the usual theory, like here, instability is bad. And really, the key point is that I cannot believe those experiments. I mean, those experiments, they seem, all of this, in my opinion, seem a little bit too good to be true. Like even, you know, this inductive bias because of the oscillation, like there must, there ought to be a more general theory there, are more general principles at play. I mean, it seems like too, too good of a coincidence, but I'm certainly not able to see this more general principle at the moment. And I think the problem is just, we don't have enough evidence, enough controlled experiment, enough, you know, toy setting where we exactly understand what's going on to try to uh, build this more general picture. So, so, you know, let's, let's do it. Thank you.